I start this lecture by uh, summarizing the mainstream cosmological models in physics, through which uh, I will try in this lecture to highlight a possible role of the consciousness, something I called in this title as shaping spacetime. We have two models. The first is coming from general relativity and the second from quantum physics. The first is the block universe, today considered as the best way to represent the universe, if we accept all consequences of general relativity. It implies in particular that our future is already realized and cannot change. The second is the multiverse model, which contains at our human level all alternative possibilities to conduct our life, but all are completely separated ones with other copies of our consciousness. This is coming from quantum mechanics, with the today consensus that the Everett multiverse is the best interpretation of quantum mechanics. But what is precisely a block universe? It's a conception of space-time where the future already exists, as much as the past, and where the notion of time is perfectly relative to the observer, and finally, to consciousness. Note that in this conception, there is no more a present after which the future is not still created. No, all the future is already created. Now, there is a problem with both models, which are mathematically okay, but don't really satisfy physicists, because first, the block universe is incompatible with quantum mechanics and finally with our free will. Second, the multiverse is incompatible with Occam's razor because the number of different block universes in the multiverse is a quasi-infinite one. The proposition I develop in this lecture, which is illustrated by this moving tunnel, a flexible cylinder, is a solution to this problem that maintains a compatibility with the mainstream vision through two ideas. First, the multiverse is our own a field of possibilities for our free will. Second, our consciousness is like an operator of free will involving out-of-space-time information that permits to commutate timelines. So, the solution is that the block universe should not be rigid but flexible. But is there something in physics that suggests its flexibility? I say yes, extra dimensions or quantum gravity. I will develop this a little. During the evolution of our conception of time, we have first defined a block universe with the present, and then we have made the present disappear altogether, with the past and the future having the same existing position. It has been said that time does not exist. Why? Innovations as GPS and atomic clocks show that we can travel in time a little bit, and equations show that we can actually also travel in the far future. Some models with wormholes even authorize traveling in the past. On the question of time, general relativity and quantum mechanics are rather compatible. In quantum mechanics, the famous partial non-locality experimented by Alan Aspe in 1981 is not only a special one, but also a temporal one. Particles may remain entangled not only despite astronomical distances without a signal that allows them to be correlated, but we have the same phenomenon over time. Both theory and experiments show that there is a temporal entanglement and that quantum events can be correlated not only if separated by space, but also if they are separated by time without any signal traveling in time. I illustrated in red three states that are in the past, present and future and can be correlated to other possible versions of these states. They are then entangled over time. The best way to understand this is to deal with two potential realities that are defined by two timelines. And today, quantum gravity, a very successful theory, though it has not been proved yet, 
is dealing with such potentials, which means that timelines, in particular in the future, can fluctuate out of time. And then time does not exist in the sense of something that creates reality. It would rather be something that emerges, a thermodynamic emerging phenomenon. It is even now considered that present time could be a thermodynamic illusion created by the brain itself. To get out of this illusion, we should consider time as we consider space. It would imply that the present moment has a thickness. To try to understand this better, to integrate this idea that time might not exist, that the present could be plunged by the future and preceded by a past that would be just as real as now, we could say that the present could have a real thickness especially since our brain is capable of making us anticipate the future and memorize the past. So we can wonder if it is not the idea of sequential time that could be an illusion leading us to speak of anticipation and memory while their information is already or still here. Because if you consider space, the local space does have a sickness. If I consider that what I see on my right is in the present, just as what I see on my left, space has a certain thickness. Mechanics, whether classical or quantum, does not make too much difference between time and space, so the time could have some thickness, really. And it is only the thermodynamic illusion that creates the time that would give us the impression that there is a front of the present that would create reality when it would not exist in fact. I represented two figures in green and blue to illustrate that. In green, imagine that it is a displacement of our brain consciousness, where the consciousness has clearly a sensation of the thickness of the present. But if you consider now in blue a brain without consciousness or with a little bit of consciousness, this brain will put illusory time at every point, it will look around and finally navigate blindly without having a choice to make in its trajectory. If you consider that, on the other hand, time has a certain thickness, which is the thickness of the consciousness. At this level, one can even wonder what is the difference between time and consciousness. You are going to have a problem of choice. That is, if you find yourself in front of a junction, the brain says, no, there is no choice. But your consciousness says, yes, I have a choice to make. So the thickness of time, which could be something more real than the front of time, that is illusory sequential time, imposes us choices. Good. But does physics allow free will? In quantum mechanics, the necessity of choices exists. There is even a theorem of free will. But in classical mechanics, we are not used to considering this possibility. It has even long been customary to consider that classical physics was deterministic, but it has been widely disputed by many renowned physicists. For example, Trin Juan Juan says in a book that Cao could liberate matter or physicists like Antoine Suarez and Nicolas Giza, they have repeated in the relativistic field the famous experiments of Alain Aspect in 1981. They are both supporters of free will. In his last paper, Suarez says that the quantum multiverse belongs to us, belongs to our choices, and that we would have a free will thanks to that. And Nicolas Giza says Free will can exist because the real numbers that allow classical physics to be deterministic do not exist in reality. That is to say, we cannot inform a number describing reality with an infinity of decimals or information. If we think about all the reasons for questioning the determinism of classical mechanics, we always come to a problem with information. And this led me to do research to develop calculations of billiards and publish recently an article. In this paper published in Annals of Physics, I conclude that 
mechanics absolutely does not determine the course of events, except briefly or incompletely. To determine the course of events, we would need to add six additional dimensions to the space-time, three to define the choices that must be made in the present, in the presence of bifurcations, and three to define the choices that must be made to determine the destination. Remember that it is not mechanics, neither in the present nor in the future, that determines what we are doing or what we are going to do. And finally, the choice of our timelines have to be made out of time, probably via quantum gravity or extra dimensions, which makes no difference. At the origin of this strange statement, we have the problem of physical information. This is somewhat complicated, but so important to know this problem, so I develop it. For at least a century and a half, physicists fought to try to find a solution to the famous paradox of the demon of Maxwell. It says that you just have to give information to this demon who has the capacity, without consuming energy, to open or close a small door between two gas chambers, which allows it to sort the molecules and thereby put pressure or heat on one side or the other, thus creating energy simply from information. The problem is that it contradicts the famous second law of thermodynamics, stating the entropy can only increase, and in addition it would create energy very easily, and if it was true we would know. Today, we solve this problem by saying that information has a cost in energy. And it was finally demonstrated in 2012 that manipulating bits costs energy. This shows that information must be placed alongside usual physical quantities of mass, etc. At the quantum scale, we also have the principle of uncertainty which is fundamental. One cannot know both the position and the momentum of a particle. In fact, it comes down to limiting the amount of information of the phase of a particle to a certain bounded value. This information is finite. Now let's move on to unification theories. In order to unify quantum mechanics with general relativity, these theories are also obliged to use models that say that no length less than the length of Planck, about 10 to the power of minus 35 meters, has physical sense. Looped quantum gravity goes even further by saying straight that all the information associated with any physical object is finite, including mass, energy, time. So, we would finally live in an information universe. And it is not so surprising insofar as information is primary before physical quantities because a mass or a temperature are informations. They are characterized by information. We can easily admit this from the moment we understand that physics leads us to accept a reversal of perspective that consists in saying that information is the first objective thing, though it is usually depending observer. Many different theories are going in this way, for example the holographic model, but don't forget the plateau scale. So, today physics discovers that information is first and all. And what is information but consciousness? And what is consciousness, if not information? Let's remind that the great physicist John Wheeler has been given the phrase it from bit, everything is information. The key point is then to understand that everywhere in the universe, information is finite. So, now I can explain the extra dimensions in my recent papers published in Annals of Physics. When information becomes fundamental, the problem of propagation of uncertainty in dynamical complex systems such as a billiard, but also into all living systems, becomes a fundamental problem.
It implies that mechanics cannot calculate beyond a certain amount of information that I found to be of the same order as information contained in two initial conditions. If we do not add information, we calculate a multiverse and not one reality. If we do not add extra information, information density decreases over time due to increased uncertainty during interactions and the system becomes a quantum one. But things around us are not quantum. So it means that there is something that adds information to the system and that is not decoherence because decoherence doesn't make choices at bifurcations. It means that there is extra dimensional information that intervenes to help the mechanics to create a single reality. This is very important. This additional information would come either from additional dimensions, from outside space-time, from the quantum vacuum, or from the future. We don't know, but in all cases, we have extra observable space-time data. This implies that the basic laws of mechanics must be conceived not as laws that create reality, but as laws that transform information into another, laws of unfolding reality during a certain time. The laws of physics are not creative. The mechanics works a long time only in special cases, when there are very few interactions or when you consider planets or other objects that will interact very little with their environment, or when this environment will have a low mass compared to the mass of the body. Only in special cases does the mechanics work, and we have developed our vision of the world from these particular cases, while in reality mechanics cannot create the course of events. This result I found and published is in accordance with the results that mathematicians published two years ago for which they were awarded in 2016. Mathematicians have showed that with deterministic equations, after a certain time in a billiard table, the balls lost the information corresponding to their initial conditions and a Brownian movement is established. This natural loss of information is the origin of the macroscopic multiverse. The laws of physics are not calculating a single reality, but a multiverse of potentialities. I calculated the factors of increasing the number of multiverse branches in a billiard table, and I found that the number of bifurcations that appear is independent of the accuracy of the calculations. We can work at a precision down to the plan scale and even below, we will never prevent the multiverse and we will have exactly the same amount of bifurcations after a certain delay. It means, by making a shortcut, that classical physics is essentially quantum. There is no difference between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, except that classical mechanics becomes quantum only after a certain delay in the future, where we never live a delay from the present moment, which will depend on the considered system. If it's a planet, it's going to be very long. If it's a living system, it can be really a few seconds. Now I come back to the objection of decoherence. For a non-isolated system, the phenomenon of decoherence prevents the reality from becoming quantum but it does not prevent the multiverse from settling because it does not determine the choices. Decoherence does not inform the universe which reality we are in. We always need extra-dimensional information to know which universe we live in. Now, there are very important consequences of all this. Finally, in a billiard table but also in any complex system, all the possible final conditions compatible with the initial energy are systematically wretched after a certain time. And if, in addition, you wait long enough, 
you can even allow the luxury of finding a multitude of paths that connect initial and final conditions. As it is valid for all types of interactions, we can extend it to our human scale and daily life. I give an example. Tonight I'm going back to the hotel. The path I will follow is now perfectly defined according to the theory of the block universe. But in an hour, this trip may have changed because maybe this afternoon I meet someone who will make me follow another path. Does physics make it possible? Yes, because it is possible to keep exactly the same future tomorrow while changing the past today without changing the structure of the universe. I just have freedom to choose the path that will allow me to go back to my hotel tonight. Even in the case I meet a person who will have a great influence of, on my life, it does not pose a problem to the dynamics of space-time because if really in my future I do something with this person, space-time will be able to send me another opportunity to meet him or her. There is enough fluidity, thanks to this multiverse, that can be adjusted from the final conditions to bring us the true free will in our daily life. From this speculative proposition, I have concluded that we can change the program, switch our timelines. The information necessarily extra-dimensional plays a role and determines the path, the commutations, and the change of path that we are going to take. That still physics, so it is incomplete. Where does this information come from? We could say it is linked to free will. Would not that mean that our brain consciousness system would be a navigation system? It is the moment to make the difference between brain and consciousness. Brain, as decoherence, is not able to make the choices at bifurcations. Only consciousness is able to bring extra-dimensional information that make us live only one reality. This is a classical point of view, but the same result as the well-known role of observer in quantum mechanics. But we still have to solve a problem before considering that commutations and bifurcations are possible, since it is about making the different commutations compatible. If I switch... I will change the life of someone who will be on my new course, etc. Can physics allow it? Is not it going to cause something that will destabilize space-time? In fact, no, because we can make all switches compatible with each other thanks to the principle of macroscopic entanglement. Today, it is more and more accepted by great physicists. Thibaut Damour? talks about quantum cosmology, a possible generalization of quantum on a macroscopic scale. Today, more and more physicists think that there could be a macroscopic entanglement at a macroscopic scale, and in particular between individuals like Alan Kohn's, for example. This is considered seriously by some physicists. And we discovered recently, and I did it myself, that we could simulate the entanglement with the help of neural networks. Entanglement uses information that will coordinate from outside space-time systems that are totally isolated. Without going into detail, those who know the equality ER equal EPR know that there are other ideas that joins what I say here. This means that changes in the future necessarily require that our timelines be macroscopically entangled. But how do we stabilize the process? Just by banning the process when it's not possible. And it's simple since the future is already there and already exists. The future itself will prohibit commutations that are incompatible with the future. This leads to the acceptance of retro-causality. And today, highly respected physicists like Yaki Aronoff explain it, even make experiments to demonstrate that it is quite possible to accommodate the reality of quantum mechanics with our free will 
provided the acceptance of retro causality. It is possible to accommodate the indeterminism of quantum mechanics with our freedom, provided we accept retro causality. Retro causality does not have to shock. It only shocks people who believe it is a signal. Initially, when Costa de Beauregard proposed this concept in the 50s, it was frowned upon because people understood that a signal was sent from the future. It's not that at all. It's exactly the same thing as spatial entanglement. It is a temporal entanglement without signal. It is not a problem in a universe where the future is already there and the past still there. Simply, one must reason with events and timelines instead of reasoning with points of matter that move in time. Physics teaches us to stop reasoning with matter that moves in time. Moreover, it realizes that matter does not exist, that there are only densities of probability of presence, etc. Retrocausality is the key point to really understand time and consciousness. One can finally understand time and then consciousness in a wonderful way if taking seriously all that physics suggests to us. The biggest problem for physicists right now is to resist to dogmas, strict causality, determinism, irreversibility, materialism, etc. When we relativize dogmas and take seriously all the results of physics experiments and theoretical models, we come to the conclusion that reality is not created in time but in another way. That from Carlo Rovelli. Time, <clears throat> the sense of the creative front of the present, does not exist. The past still exists and the future is already created, but I add the fact that our unique future is flexible, it can change. Then the key point is that the future could influence the present. My cybernetic point of view, due to my long experience in computing engineering, tell me that it is possible to create a mini space-time, a toy model, but if I am told you shall calculate the future according to the information you have in the present moment, I will not be able to do it. I would have to bring in outside information, and there I risk a bug. On the other hand, if one brings to me you shall take such future and calculate the present reality while changing that of the future, then I have no problem. I just use my switching system by introducing information from the outside. But I switch only when I can switch. It's like a GPS. You are moving in a car, you have a perfectly precise journey, and at any time the GPS tells you, you go there, turn left, right, etc. Well, you keep the option of not following what the GPS says. You keep your free will. And what will it do? The GPS will recalculate your course. For a while, it will tell you uh, turn around until it understands that in fact you wanted to do something else. As its destination is still scheduled, it has found a new route to take you to your destination. And you notice that at no time, The universe has lost the thread of history, and it is quite conceivable to develop, I could do it, a multi-GPS. It will surely exist in the future, if only to avoid traffic jams. From the moment we are able to conceive, thanks to technology, a system that is a little complicated and clever to, to manage the commutations of timelines of a lot of people to take them safely to work, Don't you believe the universe is able to do so? Now we have to hang that up by making the link between physics and consciousness. What I'm saying is that it is quite conceivable that the information introduced to achieve these commutations is information that expresses itself through quantum gravity. But I don't intend to develop quantum gravity here. Just remember that As our great Roger Penrose, 
I consider that the information of consciousness is quantum information. This is the point to memorize. To summarize, I propose to model this quantum or consciousness information coming into space-time and making our future change. I developed in the past computer neural networks for vision systems and thanks to this experience, I learned that if there are perfect architectures for analysis or recognition tasks, they are very, very bad, not at all adapted for memorizing or synthesizing images. That was an additional reason for me to think that consciousness information is not included into the brain, but into upper layers or extra dimensions of space-time. Still, we could model this in a toy model of space-time by a neural network with three layers, because we need to add one layer to define the path of timelines and another one to define their destinations. So a three layers neural network that would contain bifurcation data of entangled timelines would define a single future. On this basis, we could imagine toy models that simulate consciousness properties like intention and attention, but I don't want to enter here into psychology. This requires to accept the model of dual causality and hence the influence of the future. But what one could ask, is double causality a falsifiable theory? I answered that yes, it is falsifiable and that I've been trying to falsify it for four years. The problem is to test the flexibility of the space-time and the lead that I explore is the introduction of chance in advertisements or web robots. The principle is the statistical analysis and the search for serendipity. One of the goals is to develop different experiments. I have one working at this moment with hundreds of people via a web application, and we already have very interesting results. But it's time to conclude, and I will just say that all these experiments aim to highlight the link between chance and consciousness. I will conclude by saying that our understanding of consciousness cannot avoid a cybernetic conception of a flexible space-time that is constrained simultaneously by initial and final conditions. It solves temporal paradoxes via double causality and takes into account information outside space-time as control parameters. My theory is to say that this is the world of consciousness. This implies relativizing the ontological scope of the equations, because equations are tools and their premises, determinism and continuity, are not compatible with reality. It also involves finding the appropriate cybernetic models, be it fractal, multiscale or neuronal, to connect entanglement indispensable for commutation and different stages or dimensions to accept the idea of an acausal configuration in physics. It already exists. I mean the need to inform about the final conditions already exists. In my laboratory, for example, a colleague with whom I publish, specialist in fluid mechanics, uses it in appropriate dynamic models. In human sciences, it means avoiding confusion between brain and consciousness, which will play the role of providing additional information and accepting the search for experimental protocols to falsify or highlight the influence of the future on the present. Now, so as to prove all this, for me, the Internet and big data are promising leads on this subject. There are others, but the biggest obstacle is preconceptions or fear of a lot of researchers, research directors, directors of laboratories. You see that the biggest problem in the advancement of research is simply the hyper-specialization and formatting in which physicists are generally locked up. So, I pay tribute to the organizers of this Congress for bringing together specialists from different disciplines to talk about this fundamental problem that is consciousness, or we can say time, as it remains the same. 
Thank you for listening.